Empathy is the ability to see the world from another person's perspective. The capacity to tune in to whatever someone else might be thinking and feeling about the situation, regardless of how that view might differ from your own perspective. It is an extremely powerful interpersonal tool. Unfortunately, empathy often falls by the wayside because when we need it most, we are the least open to using it. That is, if we are under stress, if we are misunderstood or irated or defensive. But it isn't just others that we tune out from. What's curious is our own ability to sabotage ourselves when we aren't in tune with our own emotions. Emotional intelligence, or EQ, is proven to be as important in success as IQ, or in some situations it can be even more important. And yet it is much less readily taught in schools or even understood. Today I have the author of The EQ Edge and also Emotional Intelligence for Dummies. Dr. Steven Stein is a leading expert on psychological assessment of emotional intelligence and how to improve it. He has worked with the FBI, the US Air Force, the Army, Navy, and the Pentagon to help them improve their emotional intelligence and identify why high performers succeed. He's also worked with numerous corporate organizations like American Express and Coca-Cola, and he's even worked as the lead psychologist in reality TV shows such as Big Brother and MasterChef. So if you want to know how to measure your own emotional intelligence or how the FBI uses emotional intelligence, or what a psychologist does behind the scenes in reality TV, well, this is the episode for you. I'm also joined today by my brilliant co-host, Emerson Montano, who gave me such a good set of questions to ask Dr. Stephen that I decided he could just come on the show and ask them himself. And it was really nice for me to hear some questions that I maybe wouldn't have thought of myself and really helped add something to the interview. And on that, stay tuned to learn about your emotional intelligence and how to improve it. One of the things I'm interested in is that you can take a test to find out your emotional intelligence, but what are the everyday signs that you may or may not have emotional intelligence or specifically why you might be lacking it? So there's a number of signs, things that you can look for. One is whether a person is just listening to you or not, paying attention to what you're saying, or are they ignoring you or just spewing out what they want to spew out of that? So Something we call empathy, the ability to sort of listen and take in where another person's coming from. That's a good sign. The relationships, you know, how we deal with other people. Some people are respectful and deal well with others and others may be bullying or ignoring other people. So those are some of the signs that you can tell right away if someone tends to have higher level of emotional intelligence. And how might you tell for yourself what are the signs of your own personal emotional intelligence like with inside you well one real big clue is whether people tend to avoid you or not right you know you get a sense that if people can't stand you they just want to get away from you as quickly as possible that's a pretty good sign that you're low in emotional intelligence if you find that people are attracted to you or want to talk to you or like to reveal things about themselves to you that's a pretty good sign of someone that has high emotional intelligence mm-hmm how much does emotional intelligence vary day to day or week to week within for one person? It can vary quite a bit. I mean, especially around events that happen to you. If you just go through something pretty negative or something, you know, unpleasant, that can kind of lower your ability to, to use your emotional intelligence skills. I think of them as skills, right? That we have them to a certain level, but we may not always exercise them. You know, it's like building muscles in the gym. We don't always use our full strength, but there are times that we just don't feel like using those muscles and we may appear, you know, someone may say, you know, why did you avoid me? Or how come you didn't pay attention to me? Well, I might've been distracted or there may have been other reasons that prevented me from using those. Interesting. Cause certainly with IQ or let's say like trying to do a math problem, if I'm hungover, I'm going to be worse at maths, but I feel like my maths level is more constant, whereas my ability to be rational and like nice to people is way more variable over time. It could be variable over time. Well, your ability to use it, even your math, like you said, it, it won't be so good if you're hungover or something's interfering with your ability. It is kind of similar with emotional intelligence that if you're hungover, you're probably not going to be very emotionally intelligent. You're, you're going to be self-absorbed as opposed to paying attention to other people. I guess the difference is that 
mass is obviously going to be hard if there's like three people talking to me about other things at the same time. Whereas emotional intelligence, the point, well, at least for outward emotional intelligence is to be good at it with other people around and lots of stuff going on. So part of the strength of emotional intelligence is surely your ability to do it under stress. Yeah, good point. So while we're under stress and we look at that sometimes when we evaluate people, their ability to really focus or pay attention to the most important things that are, you know, within their sights. Interesting. So besides just the day-to-day constants, and what about like year-to-year? What are the main factors that change people's emotional intelligence naturally? And then what are the factors that improve it or that you can purposefully use to improve it? Well, we find some, some differences over age, over wide age range. Problem solving, for example, your ability to be less emotional when solving a problem, that gets better with age. You know, when you're younger, you tend to make decisions quickly, be more impulsive about things, not really think them through. But what we found is as people get older over time, they're more pensive, they're more thoughtful about the decisions that they make. So that's one of the areas. Another one may be empathy. Sort of in our middle years, we learn to be a bit more empathic and, and listen to more other people's concerns or issues. When we get much older, when we find that more people just don't care about others. They tend to be less empathic. It sort of goes down from the earlier years. You're more concerned about your self-preservation and your own ability to survive over time. I guess one of the factors of time is just general maturity and wisdom and learning from mistakes. But what if I wanted to like take a crash course to make myself way more emotionally intelligent in two weeks, what would I do? The best way to probably improve it is through some kind of coaching or with someone. It's not the kind of thing you learn in a classroom or just reading a book, although, you know, I don't want to put down my own books, but that's kind of the educational part that's learning about it. But if you really want to improve it, you've got to go out in the world and do things. We recommend doing certain exercises, approaching people, talking to them, getting to know them, learning about them. They're the kinds of things you have to do in vitro, like in the real world, if you really want to improve. Okay. So it'd be hard to make a checklist of things to just study over two weeks, but like if you took a gap year or like just did things where you went into very different environments and sort of had different jobs as a more variety in your experiences to call upon. Yeah. And in terms of sort of a, a checklist, there's probably a checklist of behavioral things that we could, we can point out for you. I know in the book, Emotional Intelligence for Dummies, we have a number of things that you can do out there in the world to help improve it, you know, like changing your routines to get used to being more adaptable to different things. So there are certain things you can kind of check off over your, your year or whatever period you want to take to improve. Do you find certain occupations have people with a lot more emotional intelligence than others? And, you know, emotional intelligence has like 15 different skills. So the, the sort of balance of those skills change. So for example, if you look at good salespeople, they come out as really high in, and these I'm talking about successful ones, come out high in things like empathy and this the very specific skills that, that lead them to rise to the top. We've been studying like within occupations, what are the, the skills that differentiate the high performers from the not so high performers? So even looking at physicians, you know, what makes a, a physician who's outstanding versus one who gets himself into trouble? What looks, how do we compare lawyers? How do we compare plumbers? How do we compare computer programmers? Obviously some, some professions require more emotional skills because you're dealing with people more as opposed to sitting in front of a screen all day. So those kinds of occupations generally require kind of as an entry that you're going to have higher skills of dealing with people and understanding people and, and being assertive. Can you give me a few specific examples or just one example from one of those lists of different trades of how you would then compare the differences of a good versus bad programmer and what the findings are of why, what makes someone good or bad. Pick programmer, I guess, as an example. So there's a, a tool called the EQI2 Emotional Inventory 2.0 that we've been using for close to 30 years now. In the studies that we've been doing, we've been taking groups such as computer programmers and looking at those that are rated as high performers versus those that are having challenging times that are not as high in terms of their performance and tried to pick apart the skills. So what are the emotional skills that we look at? Generally, things like self awareness your ability to express yourself, your ability to develop and maintain relationships with other people, 
your ability to use emotions when making decisions effectively, not getting over emotional or not under emotional when making decisions, or your ability to manage stress. Those are the kinds of things that we look at, and they're broken down into like 15 specific categories. So looking at programmers who are more successful, for example, one of the skills may be assertiveness in terms of your ability to express yourself. Because when you have a problem or a situation you don't understand, you're more willing to ask someone for help. You know, what do I do here? Can you help? As opposed to someone who sits there all day trying to solve it and not being very successful at it. So that's the, the sort of the way that we look at it within all the different occupational. So like your three top tips to someone who was, let's say, a computer programmer that was doing, performing badly in your tests and metrics to help them get better. Well, what is really around people skills, learning to, to pay attention to other people, to listen to other people, to understand where they're coming from, to be more assertive with other people, being able to ask for help or advice, that kind of thing. Also to be more aware of your own emotions when you're getting frustrated or you can't solve a problem, being able to read that within yourself and then maybe take action, maybe sort of step back, don't get overloaded with the frustration. So those would be three things, to be more self-aware, to listen better to other people and to express self, especially when you need help or when you want to interact with someone else in an effect. So it sounds like certain occupations draw people that have, you know, the natural skills that are desired for those occupations. Let's say someone enters a job and their skills in emotional intelligence don't necessarily align with the skills that you observe that make, say, someone outstanding in that field. How much does being in the job improve your own emotional intelligence? Sometimes it, it may, but a lot of times it doesn't because it's not enough. You know, you, if you don't have emotional self-awareness, you don't know what you're doing wrong. You know, people just don't want to sit with you at the lunch table and you're scratching your head. What's, you know, what's wrong with me? Is it my deodorant? I mean, what's going on here? So it requires often an outside source to help you with that. Maybe a coach or a fellow employee, someone that you trust who can kind of point out and say, you know, listen, Sam, the things you're saying are kind of hurtful to other people. If you could maybe tone it down or in other ways, you can tell them what you want them to know, give them this information. So it usually requires more of an outside source to help you specifically with this, to focus directly on the behaviors. I'm wondering, because I feel like some of these things might come across really annoying. Let's say I was someone's boss and I'm like, yes, yeah, so you're not really very good at talking to people and you're a bit silly and like, you just act like a toddler. How would I even phrase that in a way that sounds very mature and like the person's actually very good at things? Well, you'd phrase it, you'd say, have you noticed that when, when you go to talk to Ellis that you're not really succeeding very well. You're not really getting your point across. Have you, have you noticed that happening in your conversations? Do you ever wonder why that happens? I mean, have you thought about that at all? But so first of all, did you notice it's happening? And if you didn't notice it, well, remember the other day in the lunchroom when the two of you were sitting there and he just sort of shrugged his shoulders and walked away? Didn't that seem strange to you? What do you think was going on? So I try and ask you if you're aware of the issue. I would sort of question you. And then hopefully to, we get to a point where you say, yeah, you know, I did notice that I find it difficult to deal with George. I can deal much better with Lily, you know, in, in the workplace. So well, what do you think he could do differently? Are there things that you're saying that maybe are off-putting to George? And we sort of explore that and say, well, well how might you have said that a bit differently? Maybe he saw that as insulting or as, as that you're challenging his knowledge, something like that. So we kind of work on it gently. We're, I'd get you to see it each step of the way. I'd want you to understand what we're getting at and sort of gently move you along to say, yeah, you know, you walk out of there saying, well, yeah, maybe I could talk a bit differently to George next time when I have a problem with what he's doing. Yeah, that sounds challenging, but like definitely a better way of doing it than just saying that you're immature. Well, I was going to ask, have you seen organizations have successful programs around improving emotional intelligence in their workers? Again, we outline this in my books. One of them, one of the biggest ones was an early study we did with the U.S. Air Force. Early in our days, about 20 years ago, when we started a lot of the work in emotional intelligence, they called us with a problem they were having in recruitment. They were having a 50% turnover rate in recruiting Air Force recruiters. They wanted to know if emotional intelligence would make a difference, so they invited us to do a research project with them. 
So we went and we tested 1,700 U.S. Air Force recruiters. These are like salespeople trying to get other people to sort of join the Air Force. And what we did is we had them rate the recruiters. They all had quotas wherever they were located throughout the U.S. or even throughout the world. They had quotas. So we had them put them into two piles, the, the top third, the ones who were surpassing their quotas, and then the bottom third, the ones who were just not making their quotas, were not successful. And we looked at the test results, and we looked at the emotional intelligence differences between the two groups. And what we found is there were significant differences, and I believe there was five skills that really differentiated these two groups. So a couple of them were actually empathy and assertiveness, and there were a couple of others that differentiated them. So we thought that was great. That was a real interesting study where we validated that. But they came back to us and said, no, no, we're not finished yet. We want to take the next year and we want to select people based on those emotional skills. And if we really want somebody in that position, we want to be able to sort of train them in the skill they're lacking and see if they're more successful. So we worked with them over the next year or two on that project. And what we found by selecting for skills like empathy and assertiveness and train, they actually set up an empathy training program for people that they really wanted, but their empathy wasn't high enough. What we found at the end of that period was that we increased their retention by 92%. And that resulted in a $2.5 million saving in terms of training, moving people across the country. And this was all validated in a GAO report, government accounting office of the U.S. government. So that was probably one of our big success stories where we were able to save them significantly. And here we are about 20 years later, and we're still working with the U.S. Air Force, as well as the Army and the Navy and the Marines, FBI, and many other groups who've seen the success of and the difference that it makes when you pay attention to these skills and focus on them. What does an empathy training course look like? There may be, you know, different versions of it, but basically in its simplest form, we get you to observe a situation, you know, two people interacting or, or something like that. And we see if you can interpret what went on. What was person A saying or feeling? What was person B saying or feeling? And we sort of help work with you to be more accurate in reading where other people are coming from. And then we have you do exercises with your partner, if you have a partner, where you'll talk about a certain subject. Be talk about a film that you both saw. I'll have you come back and say, well, what did your partner think of that film? Did they like it or not like it? What did they like about it? What made them happy? What made them sad? What made them angry? So we work with you. You have to go out and do exercises where you actually learn to read other people better. In the case of the, of the Air Force or salespeople, it's hard to sell to somebody if you don't know what they really want. It was partly why it was so successful, because when you recruit someone or try and sell them something and you just throw things at them and you don't even know if they want them, you're not going to be very successful. But if I get to know Sam and I know what Sam's wants and needs are, I'm going to be much better at trying to fill the gap of what Sam is really looking for and solving a problem. Yeah, I always thought when I was young, like sales was a really sort of dirty thing, but I'm like, well, actually as an entrepreneur, sales is just listening really well to the customer and working out what they actually want because they'll buy the things they want and need. And so it's just like a exercise in empathy and understanding them. And it's a good thing in the right places. One thing I haven't spoken about empathy relates to a question that I've been wanting to ask is what are the differences in general emotional intelligence across neurodiversity? So things like ADHD or autism or narcissism or like borderline disorder, quite a few big things there. Like, do you, do you test people with these disorders and like how and show how it varies? Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it varies greatly. I mean, a narcissist often doesn't have very much empathy because they're so focused on themselves and, and making themselves better and blowing themselves up, you know. People with neurodiversity issues is, is an interesting one because we've been involved with some programs, specifically in the, in the world of autism, trying to help people who are autistic to learn somewhat to pay more attention to the cues that are around them and how that could be helpful. ADHD is, is probably a bit easier to work with in terms of trying to increase these kinds of skills, trying to sort of get people to be a little more patient, to sort of calm down and, and the reasons to do it. And if you do it in the right way, if you approach it in the right way, there are methods for teaching empathy skills to each of these groups, but you have to target it to what their specific sort of deficiency is in, in learning it. So 
how would I specifically target, say, n- narcissism, where they might not even think that they have a problem or care about other people's interpretation of them anyway? Well, because they care about themselves. Again, we go to Sam as the example. So Sam, you know, you really care a lot about yourself. You want to be better. You want to be loved by more people. Let me help give you some tools to help you be a little bit more loved, right? You know, what can you do so that people don't can appreciate you more and you can get more people to love you? So we have to work with what motivates the person and then they're more willing to learn about it. So if I'm motivated, then I would just be interested to listen or any of the things that I need to do to get better just because of it's then like feeds into my actual desires as opposed to so much the then skill training afterwards. It's just making me more interested in the skill training before I do it. Right. That's the first step because it's not going to stick. If I just start throwing stuff at you and you're more interested in yourself, why should I care about anybody else? I mean, you see this sometimes with the bullying boss or whatever. Why do I care about anybody else? I just want to get more out of everybody. That's all I care about. I want more productivity, more engagement, you know, that kind of thing. So you have to have an openness or a willingness to understand why this is important. And then how about autism where you more like just don't recognize perhaps the head of emotions and things of others, like what would you do to help someone there? So we have some really interesting examples with people. And some of these people, of course, didn't realize they were autistic till later in life because we weren't really that great at assessing it, you know, 20 years ago or 40 years ago with kids. So I know one case we worked with, she's actually a CEO of an organization and she was very high IQ as well. She realized that she had this issue with people and What happened with her was she went through kind of a self-training. She was actually homeless at a point in time, and she would be outside restaurants, sometimes fancy restaurants, and she'd watch the people inside, and she'd watch how they would interact, especially couples when they're sitting at a table talking with each other. This was before there were cell phones everywhere. And she would learn by looking at the to and fro of the conversation. Oh, yeah, you wait before the other person talks. And And you watch the, and you know, she picked up all these cues and learned to apply them. And this extended on, it went well beyond that, but she was able to make some great strides and actually become a successful CEO of a nonprofit organization right now, where she was able to pick up these skills, assertiveness, and instead of being aggressive, she used to confront people or just throw things without thinking of the situation. She now takes a step back thinks about what she wants to say and delivers it in, in a much more acceptable way. How about uh, with children? Children is, is a great example too. There's a lot of programs that focus on kids right now. Again, there's a variety of models and programs teaching kids to wait, to listen to others, to ask other kids questions. There's improv games that are really fun and, and useful at teaching people to do things. You know, yes, and is kind of an improv technique. Whereas kids learn to add to the other kid as opposed to interrupt or put their own thing in there. So by using these kinds of techniques, kids can learn a lot, have fun in the process, and be more sensitive to what's going on with other kids around them. You mentioned that emotional intelligence has a lot of different aspects to it. Which of those are the most trainable and the least trainable? It's really hard because it kind of depends on the person. I mean, for some people... When you explain something like empathy, they kind of get and they go home and they listen to their their wife or their husband. And man, you know, they start paying attention and they get it. It doesn't take them very, very, you know, much in terms of training. Other things like flexibility for some people is really hard because they're used to a routine. They want to do things a certain way. They interact a certain way and they can't change that. They find that really difficult to change. We found that, for example, flexibility when I've looked at that with people with addiction problems, for example, if you're low in flexibility, it's going to be really hard to get out of that addiction problem. But when I deal with people with addiction problems who are high in flexibility, they have much more likelihood of success, of sort of beating their addiction down the road. So those are some that kind of on the high end, low end. And then there's those other 13 skills in between. Interesting. Yeah. Never really thought about addiction problems from a perspective of flexibility, but it makes so much sense as soon as you said it. And also segues directly into something I've been wanting to ask was using drugs to build empathy. Because for ADHD, there's lots of drugs that people take to sort of help them, but for autism, not so much. But then in terms of just 
how to help build your emotional intelligence. Are there any recognized things that can help? Because I've heard of things in therapy where you'll do like psilocybin therapy or for a few days or something that can like really open your mind or even ecstasy, whatever that is. Oh, yeah, brain's not working. The same drug behind ecstasy that actually can help build your sort of empathy and awareness and love for people. Is there any use of drugs in this context to actually help provide outcomes? I don't really believe that's a great way to go. I really like people to be fully aware of what they're doing and be able to learn and build on their learning. And when you're under the influence of the medications, you're a bit clouded in your memory. Like you may not, you know, you may be great while you're under the influence, but then once it's over, your memory may not be all as clear. It may not be much of a learning experience. It may be more of a crutch that, okay. When I'm under the influence, I'm really gregarious. Even like when you're having a drink, right? I'm friendly or I take more risks. That's really not the way we want to go. We want it to be more of a conscious learning experience that you can apply in various situations, not, not just under one situation. So I was happy to hear that you're not a big fan of using drugs for things, which then leads back to where you were sort of just left off on the fact that lack of flexibility can lead to addiction problems. Have you found any interventions to help people with their flexibility that then helps them address their addiction problems later down the line? That's a long range of things. In terms of flexibility for the average person is what more of that we've been dealing with. We just get them to, to sort of change routines and we start small. So it could be, you know, I have the same thing for breakfast every day. So we get to change up your breakfast. I drive the same way to work every day. So we try and change the route that you go to work. So we gradually slowly build up on changing routines and habits that you normally have until you sort of have less of a fear or less, less resistance to what you usually do. When you get into treating addictions, you're dealing with a much more serious situation and the interventions are much more all encompassing than just dealing with one aspect of it. So you mentioned there's 15 aspects to emotional intelligence, and it sounds like being high or low in some aspects can be predictive of your success at, say, breaking an addiction or in college or in the workplace. What are some interesting findings around that? Some things that maybe people wouldn't expect to be able to predict. Well, one of the interesting findings, there's quite a lot, actually. We looked at, for example, accountants, right? When you think of accountants, you think of people who are pretty straight and narrow, focused on the bottom line, on numbers and so on. But what we found was that accountants that were high in interpersonal skills tended to be the ones that rose to the top of their firms, right? They were the ones who didn't spend the rest of their career just doing tax receipts. They were the ones who suddenly moved into supervisory positions, administrative or, or executive positions in the firm. So the fact that we could predict that interpersonal skill was something that helped accountants rise in their organizations was one that was pretty interesting and used quite a bit. Geez, there's all kinds of interesting examples that we document in the book about how these skills interplay with the different types of occupation. What do you think was the most surprising example that comes to mind ahead of phase? Well, I think someone was, you know, when we used to, you know, some of my early uh, work on this, I would come to England and do presentations to HR. And we had a lot of resistance in those days. People said, you know, in England, we don't bring emotions to the workplace. We leave them at home. Well, that's really interesting. That was you know, 25 years ago. It's changed a lot since then. But one of the ones that they would challenge me with is, you know, if I was a housekeeper, what the heck do I need any of this emotional intelligence for? I'm just there by myself looking for ships type of thing. So that was a challenge, right? So I tried to go out and find housekeepers so we could see if emotional intelligence would make a difference. And in fact, someone that we work with did got some lighthouse keepers. And there is a difference. The ones that have, are higher in these skills tend to adapt more to being alone to being on their own for long periods of time. And one of the skills is self-actualization that we measure. And, you know, we talk about self-awareness at the micro level of being aware of your emotions at the time. Self-actualization is more of a macro level of, of knowing what things stimulate me, what excites me. I like music. I like learning about philosophy, whatever, Be bettering your life and improving. And it's funny because one of the areas I work on is reality TV shows where people are isolated 
met with psychologists who work on missions to Mars with NASA. And interestingly, we use some of the same assessments. They look at emotional intelligence, especially when looking at people who are going to be in isolation for long periods of time, looking at the Mars project coming up, for example, they're going to be away from people for a long period of time. So the ability to have these skills such as self-actualization, self-awareness is something that seems to be surprisingly important for people who are going to be in isolation. These are people who live and work in the Antarctic, as another example, where they're isolated for long periods of time. So even when you're not dealing with people all the time as a salesperson and you're working in an isolated kind of facility, these skills are still important. I was intrigued to find out some of your like main just lessons from being the psychologist in reality TV shows. Do people get screened before they do t the show to find people that are especially bad at emotional intelligence that are going to make better TV? Or um, is it just that you come in after the show has started and just sort of rank people and help the producers work out what's going on? No, I screen them. I've screened thousands of people. We screen them before they go on, mainly because they want it to be safe for them and for the show. And then I deal with them during and when they're leaving and follow up as well. So I deal with them throughout the whole journey of reality TV. And we don't just look for people who are specifically low in emotional intelligence. Sometimes we like people who have these skills because they're, they're, they could be likely winners. Although we do like people who are low in certain skills, impulse control is one of the skills we look at, right? So having someone who's kind of impulsive and flies off the handle can be entertaining on TV. Did you get involved at all in like the post work, making sure that people didn't lose their stuff? Been involved in a few TV things where like, actually there's, it can be really bad for the people that are participating and they can have like a lot of excitement and hopes. And then actually like the TV show just sort of makes them look like a right idiot. And suddenly it's very overwhelming and terrible as an experience to be involved in. How does emotional intelligence come into that? And what do people do to help people with that? As in, if you're trying to help someone heal from that, do you help them with their emotional intelligence or just try to make them rationalize that it's all going to be okay? Yeah, it's a combination. So I help them with, first of all, it's dealing with expectations. And part of what you're saying, some people have false expectations. They think they're going to be Paris Hilton or... or Kim Kardashian after they come off the show, which often doesn't happen or mostly doesn't happen. So it's a disappointment. Other people are maybe upset by the way they've been portrayed or they feel they've been portrayed on the show. And that's again, a different level of adjustment and, and we help them adjust to that as well. And you know, depending on, on the person, there's different ways that I might help them with that. Some of them, you know, it's, it's just part of celebrity, right? Like everybody gets attacked in social media these days, whether you're famous or loved or not loved, you're a good person, a bad person. And it's a matter of that's just the nature of the game in today's world. And we learn how to adapt and make the most of it. What's interesting is that even if someone has been, let's say, negatively treated in a show and, and the social media is pretty negative, What's happened is what I find is when those people are out in public and one of those critics sees them, they still want to have a selfie with them. They still want to get to know them because there's an element of fame involved in that person and they take delight in that. So yeah, it's an interesting dynamic we see happening in that situation. In terms of your work in reality TV shows, then did you find that emotional intelligence was a major contributing factor in success? And did you witness anybody change their emotional intelligence during a show due to like realizing what was going on? Yeah. So I find it, it can be very important in success. Some people can use these skills in navigating the show, especially when it's skills involved in the show, whether it's interpersonal skills, manipulation skills, whatever, in terms of succeeding. So yeah, some of those skills are really helpful. If you're really low in those skills, chances are you might be eliminated more quickly if, if, you know, if people see you as not very emotionally intelligent. Other times you're used as a floater or may continue. In terms of changing during the show, yeah, I've spoken to a, a number of people who found significant change as a result of being on the show. They, they've grown in a number of ways. They've learned more about themselves. They've learned about how people react to them. They've learned about people that were completely different from themselves and how to work with those people or understand those people better, get along with them better. 
So I've seen some pretty dramatic changes with people who've gone through some heavy duty reality shows. Have you found that for the interpersonal aspects of emotional intelligence, that there are big differences if you're dealing with say, interacting with someone that's a similar age to you or very different age to you or different races or nationalities? Yeah, there can be. And we've done some international work looking across countries and we've done some cross-culture kinds of work. There can be differences. For example, people in Asian cultures, Japan, for example, tend to be less assertive than people in the American or certain European cultures where they're more forthright and tell you what they think, whereas in Japan, they're less assertive, they're less wanting to express their, their thoughts and feelings to others, and they almost see you as rude if you're too forthcoming with some of those things. So yeah, we see differences, and we've helped organizations, especially when they send people to different countries and cultures, to get sort of a heads up on what to expect when moving into that culture. Yeah, I never thought about this, but yeah, we're filming from the Netherlands here, where they are very assertive with whatever it is they're thinking mm -hmm. that can be quite surprising for a British person, but for a Japanese person, crikey. But that had made me think like, it'd be interesting to bring a child up in like the Netherlands for a while and then Japan for a while, just to complete opposites. That'd be crazy. Yes. I've noticed that in the Netherlands. I've been to Holland and the, and the questions are pretty direct and, and hard hitting when you're there. It's kind of refreshing in some ways. You're like, okay, well, um, don't have any doubts in my mind about what you're actually thinking. You don't go, oh, that's lovely. When you mean it's crap, you just say it's crap, which um, it, it makes things right. easier in some ways. <laughs> right. Especially as Canadians, we tend yeah, to apologize the, for everything. So and the British. Sure it's, it it's our top skill. That and curing. It does make me think about, as in what I said about bringing a child up in different places in the same way that you can bring, you learn language intuitively when you're young, but some people are just worse at learning language. Because a lot of what you've described, certainly people that have like autism or other deficiencies have just didn't naturally pick up the emotional cues from people. And then it's just a lot of what's formed over childhood. It's just kind of intriguing as in what's going on in your brains, it develops that makes you pick up these things like the same way that you pick up a language. Just been thinking about like kind of attachment theory and stuff a lot lately of how that also happens. And is there much crossover between attachment theory? in the different styles of attachment and emotional intelligence. There have been people looking at that. It's not an area that, that I'm that familiar with, but yeah, there have been researchers who look at all the uh, sort of emotional skill components related to it. Seems intuitively like it should directly relate. Cause if you have secure attachment, someone that's like knows how to deal with their emotions and explain them to others, then you have like insecure, anxious, or you have like the avoidant who both struggle more with their emotions and interpreting them with others. But anyway, you've <laughs> confessed to not being an expert, so let's not dive into that area. There was something I wanted to ask and I've forgotten what it is. Yes. Popularity. So a lot of what you've spoken around in emotional intelligence just sounds like it describes someone that's popular, but there's a difference between likability and your ability to lead and influence others. So what are the nuances between like just general likability versus emotional intelligence. Because if I think there are some people I remember from school who are people that always liked them, but I wouldn't have ranked them as like amazingly emotional intelligent. They were just very easy to get on with versus there were other people that were very intelligent in many ways that I would have ranked higher. I, I didn't obviously have a psychometric test to check them on these things, but I feel there are differences. Yeah, you're right. Leadership requires a bit more. There's certain skills that, that we find higher in leaders. There are obviously intelligent skills, but there's decision-making skills, their ability to make good decisions, their ability to show leadership in terms of people want to follow them. You know, it's a combination of, I listen to what you want and then I deliver a message. My expression is, is forceful enough and is engaging enough to make you want to follow what I do. So we look at what we call emotional expression, which includes assertiveness, independence. Those would be more of a leadership quality. So if I'm kind of, a, I could be a friendly person, but I'm independent. I sort of march to a, to my own drummer, to a certain direction. And if you like, if I can get you to like, or I sort of convince you that the direction I'm going is good and it's not just good for me, it's good for you. We'll both benefit by doing what I'm suggesting then that makes me a better leader, right? So 
We focus on expressive skills, the ability to express my emotions in a way that is engaging for you, that you want to engage with, to be assertive. So I'm able to tell you what I really think, feel, and believe so that I'm not hiding anything. I'm not holding things back. So and I'm giving direct messages. I'm asking, I'm asking you to follow. Why don't you come with me? You know, assertiveness involves those skills, the ability to be pretty direct and get you to do what I want. And I'm independent. In terms of I make my own decisions, I'm not just following someone else. As a leader, I can make independent decisions and I'm not afraid to go th that direction. So those sort of differentiate the leadership component from just the empathy, friendliness component, but the interpersonal skills. You've got to add on those self-expression skills in addition to the interpersonal skills. What are your best tips, like top three tips that you'd give to someone to help them build assertiveness? One is to practice talking about what you think or feel about certain things. Another one is to have someone that you trust and you're close to. And when you have an experience, it could be watching a film, it could be watching a TV show, to be forthright and say, hey, this is what I think about that. This is what I like. This is what I, I didn't like about that. This is a character that I really like this character. I really hated this person. And this is why I didn't like this person. So practicing with someone that you're close to. Another way to increase your assertiveness is to really, is to really look to monitor your, your behaviors over a period of time, let's say over a week, and look at situations. And look at situations when you interacted with people and when you felt good about the interaction and when you didn't feel so good. You can almost rate your interactions on a one to five scale from not very good to very good. And when looking at that, I guess the question would be, how much better would that interaction have been had I said something different or I interacted differently? So by focusing on these things, by putting attention or shining a light on it, you're more apt to want to develop that area and see where the improvements lead you. So you've talked a bit about these different trainings or interventions you can use that people do as adults. Would you be a fan of implementing more emotional intelligence centric training in schools or early childhood? I think it's important, but I think it's how you do it. There's a lot of controversy around that, obviously, these days, where it's kind of anything goes when it comes to social emotional learning. And some people are kind of taking it to an extreme where it's just let it all out, you know, getting kids to just express feelings, even when those are really harmful or hurtful feelings in front of everyone. So I think kind of the issue is how do we teach these skills to kids in a professional controlled way that really makes a difference. And there's a lot of research in the area, but I think practice that we're seeing has gone kind of beyond the research. So if we could kind of get back and, and rein it in and be more more thoughtful in terms of how we're teaching these skills, I think they can be really useful. Teaching listening skills, teaching interpersonal skills, how to get along with your peers, those kinds of skills. I think there's a place for them in schools today. I think we have to be careful how we... Yeah, it's hard, especially when some of those patterns are kind of already built in around your interactions with people. But do you think there is room in the education system to make something that's much more, less focused on IQ and the more IQ style of things? On the subject of IQ, a lot of people will say IQ isn't everything and then also highlight the importance of EQ. Is there a correlation between IQ and EQ? They're actually not very highly correlated. They're fairly independent. So if you think of someone with really high IQ, think of your, your college professor who can't find his car in the parking lot. We see these sort of cartoons or examples of people who are really smart IQ wise, but really have very poor interpersonal skills or don't know how to deal with people. So on the one hand, we've seen that a lot. We've seen people in, in corporation CEOs who are very smart, analytical engineers, but they just can't deal well with people, uh, treat people properly. On the other hand, we've seen people with exceptionally high emotional intelligence, but not the brightest in terms of IQ. And, you know, they will get so far in terms of their ability to do things, but they may reach a limit in terms of how far they can accomplish things. So what we really want to see is a good balance of intellectual skills and emotional skills working together in a balanced way 
and that that's going to make you much more successful. One thing, I'm not sure if this is in the 15 sets of emotional intelligence, but you haven't mentioned is humor. And I really found humor can be very influential. I remember when I was young, like I was at a school, at a boarding school and my friend had a laptop and I didn't, and I wanted to play games, but he'd never let me use his laptop. And one time I asked, but I made him laugh at the same time as asking it in some kind of like deferential manner. And he just gave it to me. And I was like, oh my God, life hack. If I can make people laugh, I can get stuff. And it really built my ability to ask things in nicer ways that got a reaction, which I guess was an emotionally intelligent thing to do. But I haven't heard you mention humor at all. Yeah, well, humor is not one of the 15 skills that we look at. However, we did have a graduate student work with us, and that was a subject of his thesis. And he did find that there was a relationship between humor, certain types of humor, for example, not, sar not sarcastic humor, but the kind of humor you may be talking about, and emotional intelligence. So certain types of humor are directly related to our emotional skills. And maybe you can lump it into the interpersonal skill and maybe a little bit into the empathy because I have to know what's funny for you, right? I might, if I do a racist joke, you're not going to think that's very funny, I assume. So you have to use those skills with. Yeah. So it does seem like a good way of, well, certainly on popularity and just the ability to influence people. And cause I was just wondering, like, if you have a very dry scientific, like, okay, listen to people perfectly and do all these things, you could sort of follow the checklist, but still not be like interesting to be around and. So just because you have emotional intelligence doesn't necessarily make you more effective in some ways, unless you're like the emotions match the, like the actions, I guess. Yeah. I just kind of wondering. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the person you're describing does not sound emotionally intelligent to me. The one who's just going through that checklist. But you could be very empathetic without. Yeah, without being expressive, right. You're right. You could be empathic. I, I know where you're coming from, but I can't express myself very well. So I found running this podcast, like my growth mindset has definitely developed a lot because I've been talking about growth mindset a lot and realizing that I started it thinking I had a great growth mindset and it's way better now. How has your emotional intelligence changed having been a researcher in this for so long? And do you like regularly notice yourself just doing behaviors that you wouldn't have naturally done? Well, it certainly makes me more conscious of things that I may not have been conscious of before, pay more attention to things that I didn't pay attention to before, right? So, you know, like you're more prone to listen to people, especially if they have divergent views, if they disagree with you, I want to hear why or what is it or what, what are you thinking, as opposed to just sorry, arguing with them and trying to convince them that you're right and they're wrong. So that's kind of one of the ways, being a bit more patient, the impulse control component, I've learned to sort of, again, to sort of sit back and see what's going on before kind of intervening in a situation to make sure that I got all your ducks in a row before you leap forward and make a comment, trying to change something. Sure. And then what fascinated you about emotional intelligence to make it your main life's work? Well, I spent a lot of time working as a psychologist with kids and adolescents. And then I got into developing assessments was kind of my route, but a lot of the assessments we focused on were traditional clinical psychology assessments, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder. So I spent a number of years working in those areas, but then at some point it struck me, I spent so much time looking at what's wrong with people and there's so many outstanding people, people doing great things out there. Why don't we sort of turn that around and look at what's right with people? What differentiates people who succeed in life? And that was kind of the turning point for me. And I met someone who was doing research in that area. It really intrigued us trying to understand, you know, again, successful people versus people who struggled. And that sort of turned away, turned around the research that I was doing where I went out and looked for people who were highly successful, whether they were entrepreneurs in business or they were Olympic athletes or they were in sports and music, musicians who were highly successful. And then I worked with people who were struggling, people with homeless, people with chronic diseases who were dying. I looked at various aspects of life from sort of the highs of life to the lows of life, continually found that these skills seemed to make a difference in how people successfully coped with those various situations. 
I definitely find it fascinating. Thank you so much for coming on the show and letting us ask lots of lots of questions. Of course. All right. Thank you for the opportunity and have a good show. Cheers. You're very welcome, sir. Have a nice rest of your day. Well, thanks so much for Stephen and Emerson coming on the show. You may have noticed that that was a bit of an abrupt ending. Well, that's because it wasn't the end. We actually spoke to Stephen for an hour and a half in total, and we went into his other book on hardiness and stress responses that we will release on a future episode. I felt like the whole conversation was so knowledge dense that it made sense to break it up into two episodes, so we have something to look forward to. Emotional intelligence is a huge topic, and Stephen is so knowledgeable on it, it was a joy to learn from him. If, however, you want to know more, then do check out his best selling books, EQ Edge or Emotional Intelligence for Dummies. Details are in the description. Then if you enjoyed the show, do please share it with a friend as that is how we grow. If you are feeling emotionally wiser, then do hit us up with a good rating for dropping some knowledge bombs. Of course, if you do have any questions, drop them in a comment or shoot me an email at growthmindsetpodcast at gmail.com. And remember that life is too short to delay happiness until you've hit some goals. Seize the moment and enjoy life as you live it. So be kind to yourself and whilst you're at it, be kind to someone else too.